famed contemporary artist Donald Judd was a larger-than-life figure. Known for his minimalist objects, his no-nonsense attitude, and later for his innovative architectural interventions in the remote far west town of Marfa, Texas. There, he installed his own work and that of his contemporaries on an abandoned army base in former airplane hangars and barracks. The legend of Marfa was built around Judd's influence, along with being a pilgrimage site for art lovers. This legend has endured today through film and television, such as Joey Soloway's Amazon series titled I Love Dick, starring Kevin Bacon, who plays a Judd-like figure. Marfa also endures um, being celebrated in major museum retrospectives and compendiums of Judd's writings. Despite the attention and recent pop culture obsession with Judd's work, there's always been a major missing piece, Loretta Venturelli. As it turns out, Venturelli collaborated with Judd on architectural projects from the late 1970s to the late 1980s, and it had a significant influence on his furniture design and printmaking as well. Yet, her name has been completely erased from any discussion of Judd's work. However, my research of her collaborations with Judd most significantly challenges the notion that the architectural projects of Marfa were solo endeavors. Historical erasures like these of female collaborators happen all too frequently. That's why I'm so excited to have discovered Venturelli's significant contributions to Judd's work and to be able to share it with you today. I arrived at Venturelli's work somewhat by chance while writing a seminar paper on Judd's critique of postmodern architecture. One professor said, you know, Judd was dating an Italian architect. Maybe there's something there. Another joked, yeah, pillow talk perhaps. I made it my aim to get to the bottom of this mystery. Who was this woman and why was she written out of the scholarship on Judd? Well, first, she was an architect, a theorist, and a professor, and later in her life, a prolific watercolor painter. Her watercolors have been what she's most remembered for, despite her groundbreaking career in architecture. She was the first woman to have drawings acquired by the Department of Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art. She was among the first women hired to teach architecture studio courses at Columbia University. And she was the first and only woman granted a solo exhibition at Peter Eisenman's influential Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies in New York. There, she organized a group of young architects to form the Revisions Group which focused on the connections between architecture and political ideology. The setting for Venturelli's study of architecture was late 1960s Rome. It was here that Venturelli would bring her newly awakened socio-political consciousness to bear on her work, which was unified by how spaces are shaped by history and memory, especially through architectural typology. Typology is the classification of types based on function and shared fundamental characteristics. We might think of how shoes, for instance, come in different types. You have sneakers, high heels, boots, and each one has a different purpose and thus a different set of characteristics, how it looks to best fit that function. In architecture, the notion that certain building types best suited particular functions and geographic locations had widespread appeal in the 1970s and early 1980s. In Marfa, Venturelli proposed that types suited to that hot and dry area specifically the courtyard, the pergola, and the enclosed garden, could be combined with other building types, like the airplane hangar or pitched roof house. Each type carried with it a history and the possibility to convey meaning, but each type could also be stretched to its limits as a new hybrid. This way of thinking influenced Judd's Marfa compound, in which courtyards, pergolas, and enclosed gardens all figure prominently. Venturelli also collaborated with Judd on two unrealized projects for Providence in 1984 and Cleveland in 1986, on which his architectural reputation also rests. The Providence project developed out of a competition for a grant, which was set up by the office of the mayor to create a monumental sculpture to be installed in front of City Hall. Judd later explained that, since the project was close to being architecture, I asked a friend, Loretta Venturelli, an architect, to be partners. Their proposal began as a large-scale sculpture and developed into an architectural project. Venturelli recalled, it became evident that it was more appropriate to intervene using architecture instead of placing a sculpture. So we discussed. He proposed that we do it together, 
which was not that unusual because we had an ongoing discussion on architecture that started since we met. They also brought on Venturelli's former student, Claude Armstrong, and his partner, Donna Cohen, who had lived and worked with them in Marfa. As Armstrong later explained, Venturelli was consistently helping Don translate his ideas of space, form, and number into architectural and landscape skill. The Cleveland Project was originally a collaboration with a team of prominent artists and architects. Venturelli described the proposal as an attempt to bring the city toward the lake. Since the site was long and narrow, they devised a plan for what would resemble a skyscraper lying on its side, so as not to obscure the city or the lake view. Judd had in fact described it as such, calling the project a prone skyscraper. Venturelli related the Cleveland Project's orientation to a shared distaste for the skyscraper. Venturelli and Judd's dialogue extended beyond architecture. In 1977, Venturelli designed a desk constructed in plywood, repurposed from a Judd piece actually that had been damaged in transit from Melbourne, Australia. Judd's fabricator, Peter Ballantyne, constructed two identical pieces according to Venturelli's design. A large desk with a flat top supported on one side by a thin bookshelf and on the other by a wider rectangular box that contained bookshelves, horizontal slots to lay architectural drawings flat, and square slots to store rolled drawings. The desks were housed in Judd's Spring Street loft during the time they were together. According to Venturelli, Judd liked her desk for its formal clarity and functionality, so in 1978, he designed a comparable desk for his two children. Judd's desk, a simplified version of Venturelli's, was also constructed in plywood, also featured a flat top, and also was supported by bookshelves on each side. From 1979 to 85, Venturelli also engraved the plates for a number of Judd's prints, including 54 plates for two series of etchings. Both series of etchings and woodcuts required extreme precision a skill that Venturelli had honed as a trained architect. As she recalled, Judd had some difficulty in doing precise drawings, at least partially due to his eyesight. So he asked Venturelli to assist in the preparation and delineation of the printing plates. Venturelli identified a few particular series she worked on, noting, I did many for Donald. I mean, many of these drawings that are more technical, let's say, were done by me. Based on my research and conversations with Judd and Venturelli scholars alike, there's little doubt that the influence in each other's work and thinking at that time was great. Judd may have understood the history and aesthetics of architecture, but Venturelli was fluent in the language of architecture and design, as well as its theoretical basis. It's impossible to ignore the fact that many of these projects that were previously considered signature Judd works were in fact collaborations. Why then is Venturelli's name so completely absent from all of the books and articles on Judd's work? In this post-Me Too era, Venturelli's example illuminates a number of issues that are central today, from the importance of recognizing collaborations with female partners to the sexism that tends to skew the discourse on such collaborations, prompting an imperative question. How do we open up space for those who have been ignored? I propose that we, teachers, scholars, curators, and art historians, shift the conversation Perhaps we need to take an improv approach to our scholarship, the yes and approach. For example, see how these women have been overlooked? Yes, and now we will insert them into the history books. We will talk about them in our classroom lectures. We will we'll assign their writings in our seminars. In addition to calling out the sexism of the art world and the architecture studio, we will say yes. And we will work hard to provide access to these spaces to women using our positions of power. We will construct more exhibitions dedicated to women. We will demand more inclusion from new editions of textbooks. We will encourage our female students to apply for grants and residencies. And we will mentor all of our students to help us make real change from within. Thank you.